the right use of robust data can well be the key to the most complex marketing problem. However, more platforms, more confusion. As they say, just accumulating data is not the difficult part. Breaking it down and using it to the brand's advantage definitely is. But what if marketers had a genie there who could help them sift that data gathered from multiple touch points, help identify their customer needs in order to make their brands available to them in a very much more relevant fashion? Could we then derive the highest possible return on investment? Well, let's find out. We are here to decode the top five strategies to maximize digital ROI. And with me are some very knowledgeable leaders from the industry. An interesting mix of brands and digital experts. Uh, let me introduce each one of them. Um, let's start with Savesh Kumar, uh, Head Field Marketing India, UPL Limited. Hi, hi, Savesh. Hi, hi. We also have uh, Mukesh Guraya, Chief Marketing Officer of Modi Naturals. Hi, Anita. Happy to be here. Uh, Sneha Veriwal is also joining us. She's the Chief Marketing Officer of Vadam India, most loved tea brand. Hi, Hi Sneha. Happy to be here. Rajdeep Singh next. Uh, he's the Brand Marketing and Communication Leader at EY GDS Client Service. Hi, everyone. Hi, Neeta. Uh, Akash Bhattacharji, Head of Marketing and Partnership at Retail Store, Tata 1MG. Hey, hi. Hi, everyone. We have KRN Shobe, Head of Marketing, Metropolis Healthcare Limited. Hi, everyone. Hi, how are you? And uh, Sridhar uh, Hari Hara Subramanya, uh, Senior Director at Salesforce. Hi, good day, everyone. Nice to be here. Thank you. And uh, Deepak Sharma, Head of Marketing, Alembic Pharmaceuticals Limited, will be joining us in a bit. So let's get started. Uh, you know, gone are the days when advertising was based on uh, cut feeling, especially uh, digital marketing. You know, it's highly, highly dependent on data-centric approaches. I want to understand from you, what are the big challenges that you face today uh, while incorporating data into actionable strategies in your organization? Let's start with you, Ms. Veriwal. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thanks, Nita. So, uh, you know, I think one of the big challenges about using data is inconsistency across, uh, you know, the kind of data that you get from different sources, different platforms, both in terms of output and the input in which a lot of platforms accept data, right? I mean, I may get, get it in X format, but when you actually want to put it into, let's say, an analytics tool or a MarTech tool, it needs to be converted, right? So, of course, that makes life very, very difficult. Um, mm -hmm. I also feel the way um, how uh, the whole cookie situation is evolving, uh, you know, the, the amount of extrapolation that we could do on data earlier, right? Just looking at third-party data, overlaying it with the uh, publicly available data, all of that has gone for a toss, which means your actual access to real meaningful consumer data is actually much more limited today than it was a few years ago. So in a way, it seems like we are going a little backward in terms of the amount of data that's available to us. But I think this also then forces us to make sure that we learn to use tools and models and draw insights from what is available, which may seem like limited data, but actually is more authentic uh, data that we can start using. So I just feel that these are the two things. It's actually, you have lesser data now and the mm -hmm. whole digital, the data vocabulary is not yet consistent across all mediums. So I think those are sort of two things which make life difficult for us as uh, digital marketers. Okay. Does anyone want to add to that? Does everybody agree that we are going backwards with regard to data today? <laughs> no, I can, I can, yeah, I can just uh, add uh, something here from my perspective. Uh, yes, I do believe that I'm not sure about going backward, but yes, there's mountains of data. Uh, and I think the challenge that at least, you know, when I talk to various uh, marketers, uh, I think the big challenge that comes out is, you know, how do you make sense of that, right? And yes, I think, uh, you know, Sneha rightly identified the, the point about, you know, disparate, you know, data, right? You have to really uh, put everything together, you know, stitch it together so that you have some cohesiveness, you know, in uh, what you're seeing. And then, you know, you're able to uh, glean some useful insights that you can really act upon, right? Uh, while that sounds simple, 
uh, from but you know getting from one end of the raw data uh, spectrum to the other end where you have this useful stuff uh, you can take action on it and customers feel like okay you recognize me as a customer and my needs and so on and so forth uh, that that i think is a, is a, it's a sort of the holy grail uh, mm -hmm. and i think you know while there are multiple uh, steps involved in getting there while it's not impossible to do it yes but i think it is you know quite difficult i think in today's world yeah you know, and you spoke about you know third party data and how it's not really available to us. I want to understand from you, you know, how do you uh, today as a marketer treat first party, second party, third party data, whatever is little is available, uh, and in your entire marketing outreach to this, you know, kind of predict uh, the consumer's needs, desires, their future behavior, all of that. Is Mr. Chobe still here? I think. Uh, can we see? Is Mr. Chobe here? Okay. Uh, Savish, would you like to take that? Yeah, sure, sure. So see, uh, I mean, rightly said by Sneha, you know, we are flooded with data, but the right use of data is the, becomes the most important for all of us and where it is relevant because uh, without data, you cannot do anything, but when, where, and which data to choose becomes most important. Mm -hmm. And if we see, I mean, the source of data has become our number one, I mean, business today. If, if you see, and from there are various sources from whichever sector, whichever segment you talk about. But now the data which you get, in which perspective it's been used, which, uh, uh, which, which direction it's going. And again, as Sneha said, the data is again like is not a constant thing. It's the thing which is the most vulnerable, versatile, agile, because mm -hmm. every day it's changing. The data which you get to uh, get today might not be relevant tomorrow. So data right. is always a past, right? So we need to be little agile. We need to be little adaptive. We need to be little accommodative. We need to be having a clear understanding that what's happening in and around. Because without having that understanding, whatever data you have, the data is in past. And present, if it has changed, it will have no relevance for you. Makes sense. You know, another, I think another big problem is uh, silo data. You know, that's always proved to be uh, an impediment in adapting to the changing consumer demands. Uh, I'd like to un uh, understand from Mr. Guraya here, uh, how, uh, how does a marketer feel about this? And, you know, uh, cross-channel personalization, how do you think uh, businesses can kind of uh, overcome them? Mr. Yeah. So maybe just uh, touching upon uh, from the earlier discussion that we're having, then one of the challenges from my personal experience that I've also faced in the data is maybe Savesh also touched upon that. So usually what happens that uh, a campaign, if it performs on, on a certain parameters in one go, uh, it's not possible that if we take the same set of variables and continue to perform uh, that campaign, maybe after six months, it will not perform pretty much the same. It will not deliver the same result. Same data set will not deliver same result every point of time. Mm -hmm. And that sometime because we uh, because we try to say, okay, this kind of audience is working for me. So let me continue to work on the same audience every month, every quarter, or every six months, but we will not work. Uh, because the underlying assumption here is there that, I mean, data, it, why it's just a number on an Excel or a spreadsheet, but there's a human behind that data. And mm -hmm. that human is evolving, his preferences are changing, his journey is evolving. You don't know what, what's his mood today or at that point of time when your earlier campaign ran, what was his state of mind and what is his state of mind right now? So just taking data as it is may not be the uh, best answer. And we have faced that, uh, and we have seen very, very different results that same data set delivering completely good result and the same data set that we did pretty much the same, but it still didn't work. So the idea is that maybe should, we should go slightly more deeper in understanding the consumer insights, the old fashioned, uh, I would say uh, reality of consumer insights will still hold true even in the generation of data world because the, those consumer insights, those pain points, those ambition, those aspiration of the consumer will still help you uh, go that extra mile and make your campaign work. In terms of the multiple channel, and that's what's exactly happening right now because now the consumer journeys are extremely non-linear. Uh, consumers interact with brands at different point of time across different channels. So it's very difficult to one, 
collect all the data. And as uh, Sneha mentioned, the form of data would be very different at different platforms in the way it's stored. So gathering in gathering that data and consolidating data to map those personalized experience across cross channel is extremely complicated. It's extremely complex. Another challenge, which sometimes we all of, I'm sure all of us would have felt at any given point of time is the over personalization. Sometimes all the brands just to be part of that, build that personal experience, just go a little overboard. And I mean, we have seen, maybe I'm discussing uh, with my wife in my living room that let's plan our next holiday. And as soon as I open my mobile phone, next I see a holiday package being sold to me. And you feel like, damn, what, what's happening to me? Sometimes those, those over personalization can be intimidating. Uh, because maybe I've uh, shared those experiences or shared that journey in another app, but I would I would be uh, intimidated. How does this app knows what I was talking about or what I was doing in my offline or the online space? So so that non-linear journey and when brand falls into your journey at extremely last stage, it gets a little complicated. And as as you mentioned in the cross uh, or multiple channel platform stage. Uh, because the journeys are non-linear, it's very difficult to create a linear uh, experience or a better personalized experience in a real time. Because digital is all about creating those real-time experiences. So those those can sometimes get uh, in a in a wrong direction, and those are a couple of challenges which uh, brands always faces. And hence, obviously, you need to invest in terms of the technology, in terms of the uh, how do you automate, and not just automate, but sensibly automate, so that you don't push back your consumers a bit and uh, you have those privacy uh, uh, issues or whatever, because that's again uh, one of the most sensitive issue is your data collection or in data usage practices are GDPR compliant or they fall as per the privacy rules and regulation of the uh, or the law of the land. So these these are a couple of the challenges that as, as a brand or as a marketer we face uh, when it comes to personalization of the data. You know, very interesting that you mentioned that, you know, there was also the instance where, you know, sometimes you end up buying something for the opposite sex, like a cousin of mine was buying something for his wife, a lot of cosmetics. And for the next one week, he was flooded with ads of cosmetics, which he's not going to use, obviously. So that can also kind of go wrong completely in yeah. this case. But very, very interesting point that you made, Mukesh, also uh, about, you know, how data can be outdated and, you know, how the same set of data cannot be useful for you in the you know going forward is there an example you know that we can maybe uh, learn from is there something specific that happens to you where the usage of outdated data didn't really get the desired result for you i mean a great example could be simple consumer experience post and pre pandemic uh, the same set of campaign or same set of audience because the consumer journey or the consumer thought process evolved so much people now suddenly more health conscious so maybe if i was trying to sell my edible oil with a I mean, proposition of taste, if that is my communication, maybe that may not find so much resonance in a post-pandemic world because then people are saying, okay, I can still uh, negotiate a taste bit, but health is more important to me or immunity is more important to me or I'm willing to pay an extra money if that, that products add value to me. So uh, I, I, I would not remember exactly the message, but I've seen the same set of data and same set of communication not delivering it to uh, various different points of time. And also, if you look at philosophically, I mean, we all have heard the quote that uh, what took you here will not take you in the, in the next stage, right? So that app apply for the data as well. So if that data work in the past may not necessarily work in the future because consumers are changing, your environment surroundings are changing. And similarly, your thought process, your motivation, your life goals, they, we, everything is work in progress. We humans are always work in progress. Right. You know, Shreer, I'd like to bring you in, you know, tell us how, how according to you can one provide that uniform experience and service to customers across channels and how are you at Salesforce uh, solving this particular problem for brands? Yeah, uh, I mean, first of all, I think Mukesh makes some really uh, interesting points and uh, that definitely resonates, you know, in our, you know, conversations that, you know, when we speak to a lot of customers uh, and I'm not, I, I don't want to claim that, you know, we've solved the problem. Uh, but I do think that, you know, we have uh, the technology tools and, you know, the platforms in place that I think can address some of the things that, you know, Mukesh, uh, you know, raised, right? And and rightly so. One is, you know, again, um, in fact, I was on a panel a couple of days ago where we were talking about the so-called customer data platforms, right? Uh, this, is, uh, this is a concept that has taken on, uh, you know, a lot of interest in the last couple of years and sort of, you know, evolving into what we call as data clouds now. Mm -hmm. And what it simply means is that 
companies are recognizing that um, you know they need a place in the enterprise to store all customer related information right while that itself is not necessarily new uh, mm -hmm. what is new in today's technology is the fact that uh, it is able to actually ingest you know all kinds of data that we talked about you know from various sources which could be in silos which could be in different types or formats um, you know our own social media identities for example you know on twitter id you know my name is sridhar h on linkedin i'm somebody else and facebook and a third person but ultimately you know i'm actually the same individual right but there is technology today that can actually uh, through fuzzy logic and other mechanisms it can identify that hey this is actually the exactly the same sridhar right um, just a just a simple example but it can actually help you to you know figure out a unified profile of that customer uh, create what we call as a, a golden record right and then that golden record becomes the glue uh, that ties in all the different behaviors that the customer is exhibiting uh, not only on various channels but also over time which again i think is an important point that i think mukesh made um, we have something called as a time series analysis right uh, where again you know the, the changing preferences and the behaviors of the customer because you know their you know life situation may have changed etc cetera, etc cetera, for whatever reason and uh, the data is ab able to actually give you clues into those changes we may not know exactly what happened in the person's life but definitely from the behavior that they are exhibiting mm -hmm. um you know perhaps you know for example their past you know few purchases may have been let's say an average of you know let's say 10000 rupees uh, but now they are looking for a bracelet which is you know three times to four times you know that amount right so something has clearly changed maybe you know he got a job or she got a job maybe they got a promotion and they're able to afford more um so using this new behavior information we can almost in a real time say okay there is something that has changed so why are we not able to you know go and position a bracelet in that new price range rather than targeting them with you know some some you know some other bangle or something in the old price range so to speak right uh, this is just one example from from the industry actually we are working with a customer who's actually doing this right now now so once you do that um then i think you know from a technology perspective there are a lot of capabilities to take that you know segment in this case it could be even as granular as a segment of one which is you know i'm trying to target you individually um and then you know give you you know whatever you you know i think is you know sort of completely relevant to your situation right i have the ability to do that so what it really means is that i'm able to do it at scale right um it doesn't matter whether there are you know you are trying to send this campaign for hundreds of th thousands of customers mm -hmm. but i'm still able to personalize it at that level right um and this can happen almost you know without a, a lot of human intervention uh, you can uh, you know describe the business rules and the the criteria that you want to be put in and uh, with the you know with the help of you know big data technology and ai and so on and so forth you are able to get to that you know in a relatively i would say easier and quicker fashion than what we used to do you know in the past right so that that i would say uh, technology has really played a big role in sort of you know getting us to this stage right now okay you know akash would you like to add to that you know as a healthcare platform uh, what are the challenges that you face with regard to siloed data you getting obviously a lot of it from your own websites yeah definitely i think mm -hmm. what comes into from our website and there's like we as startup and mg has i think one of the biggest repository of the healthcare data now the biggest challenge i think what we are facing because uh, the new line of business what we are trying to create is the offline stores how mm -hmm. to get data into an because the overall user behavior of a online customer versus an offline customer is very different and is where the ai or let's say the automation starts helping us to identify that behavior that's at a broad level and even if you bifurcate the user purchase at let's say a medicine level or a diagnostic level the data helps us very like one we get into excel's manual and then move into automation to understand what is the frequency of a user while it is very easy to say that Uh, these are chronic people they are repeat users but it's very difficult to come to a point then what is the frequency at which a customer will come back and purchase to you mm -hmm. and that here is where the ai comes where it helps us uh, exactly pushes the customer or helps us 
reach out to the customer to purchase or to make them aware of oh, uh, maybe your medicine are running out of stock or maybe you need a health checkup or mm -hmm. maybe you did a test uh, 45 days back. Why don't you come get a sugar test? And as soon as you click, you also get to know that this someone in his family is maybe a, a customer of Tata 1MG and is procuring medicines of thyroid and is where I think that overall intel which the data has to tell us becomes very important. In nutshell, I think uh, how the overall uh, experience of a customer, how you engage with a customer and at what point you have to engage with the customer becomes very important with the data sets what we have. While mm -hmm. I, uh, Mukesh rightly said that don't uh, we don't want to overboard people with the data sets and get into their <laughs> private lives. But yeah, that, that, that fine tuning where to enter the customer uh, how to tap the customer and what exactly the customer needs at what time becomes very, very crucially important in that journey. And I think I was discussing this previously also with someone that uh, you miss that timing and a customer, you have lost a customer because mm -hmm. thing, uh, you need it. It's not an impulse buy, but you it's a scheduled purchase you have to be very cognizant of the fact that, okay, at this day he has purchased and these many number of steps or medicine he has purchased. Or at this point, he did a test and uh, let's say by medical record, this is the number of weeks after which this test has to be conducted. You have to circle back to that customer with that information, awareness. And it, awareness is very important because uh, if you start selling medicine, uh, the trust is gone. You have to create awareness. That awareness in form of how you communicate to the customer, what you communicate to the customer becomes very important. Like, right. and we keep on debating about it. Should we uh, make a customer uh, afraid or should we make them uh, aware? And there's a very thin line when you deal with these medical, uh, currently there's a lot of uh, conjunctivitis happening. There's a lot of fever happening. Uh, the other uh, way you can communicate is, oh, are you uh, going to get fever? No. The other way is a lot of people is, are uh, suffering from fever. Are you uh, cautious enough for your family? Identify that person and data helps you that do that. Identify that person, figure out that message to that person, deliver it. And I think you are bang on. That's yeah. how... Mm -hmm. And you know another interesting thing about you know where uh, where you operate is you know uh, I think health healthcare and diseases is a very private affair. So you have to be really tactful about where to target your customer on what screen, how many people might be watching him at that particular time whenever you know your ad might be shown eventually. Or you know those things are very very important for you. Unlike you know like a Mondelez or a Cadbury or a, or a you know Parley. You know, it's it's an impulse purchase, like an heart set. Here you have to be very tactful about your communication. And I think there are very funny examples we encounter on a day to day basis. We had we have a weight management program, and as soon as uh, <laughs> while while determining the cohort of users you want to send it to, you have to be very cognizant. You like uh, one person can think, oh why me. <laughs> The other can, am I fat? And they can sue you on that. <laughs> will be like, oh, uh, like, do I even require this? So you have, like, you correctly said, you have to be very, very cognizant on what set you are picking up and what is the communication line. Because there's a very thin line when you're dealing with healthcare between a trust and you getting into the quotes. So, yeah, I think data helps you a lot over there. Even what the customer wants to read, what they want to click, see, uh, that really helps uh, with uh, automation, I would say. Okay. You know, like you know, you're speaking about automation, uh, marketing automation. They say you know, it reduces the workload of marketers by automating repetitive, tedious tasks. But it's it's much much more than that. Uh, Savish, I would like to bring you in, and also Mr. Guraya. Uh, how can you, uh, as a digital marketer, how can you boost engagement and growth with marketing automation? Can we start with you, Savish? Yeah, I you're mute. Yeah. yeah. So see, uh, when it comes to marketing automation, it not only brings on efficiency, but also it brings on more on personalization and then lead nurturing, data-driven decisions, 
because uh, I mean you you can't uh, lead to any any decision right. I would rather I would say right decision without analyzing the right data. So automation does that, and then multi level uh, multi level channel engagement. That is only and only possible with the current scenario where everything is so versatile when you do automation. And if, it, if I talk about multi-channel engagement, it facilitates consistent messaging across multiple channels, mm -hmm. ensuring that the right message has gone at right time. So it reduces your dependency on, on many other things when it is automated. And then it is scalable. If it's not automated, I mean, reaching out to many is not possible. So it's only and only possible to be at a scale if it's automated. And then ROI and revenue revenue growth is only possible when it's automated campaigns you have, and it can lead to increased efficiency. Mm -hmm. Another important aspect becomes customer retention, which is the most important aspect in today's world, because uh, it, won't, it not only use, uh, leads to the increased profitability, but also revenue stability. I mean, existing customers are more likely to do repeat purchases. So, I mean, most of us have just cited various examples, like you cited example of cosmetics. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, the repeat, uh, repeat uh, purchase is possible by most of the existing customers. So retaining those customers can be only be possible by when you have automation. So one side you are busy with acquiring new, at the other, other end, the automation can lead to the, uh, uh, lead to the existing customer optimization. Then increase profitability because again if you have retained customers if you are in regular touch at the right time loyal customers tend to spend more and are less sensitive to change in prices leading in higher profit margins so obviously when you are into business you need profits right and referrals and word of mouth so satisfied customers are more likely to recommend your business to others and and driving business growth through word of mouth is the most effective ways and means Mm -hmm. So how to keep them in touch at a regular basis, at a frequent basis. So the solution, one and only solution is automation. It's a good idea. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, uh, automation is, a, is, is extremely important for all the marketers to save that extra uh, time in our, uh, in, our, in our life. I mean, all of us are uh, more busy than we ever were in our, in our life. So any technology tool that saves us some precious time, uh, it's not just good for us, but for the organization as a whole, and we can uh, all together contribute that to the pro increasing the productivity of the individual as well as the organization. Uh, having said that, one important aspect of automation is also is that it takes the personal biases away from the decision making because the decision making is completely data driven. I could love red, someone could write like blue, someone can else write black. So how do you come to the decision? Typically in the old world scenario, it always the person with the highest salary in the room will make a decision. And it's like, okay, because I'm the MD of the company, things should be red. But those kind of personal biases are now taken out of the uh, equation. Uh, all of us are uh, not just marketer, but also, I would say, also the consumer. And hence, those personal biases come into the picture. We always think from our friends and family perspective. I always question in the meeting room sitting and say, who watches linear television these days? Everyone is on OTT. But we fail to realize that, I mean, OTT is just 5% or 6% of the entire linear television consumption. So we all are myopic in our, uh, in our point of view because there's only that much we can uh, see around our friends and family. So that data-led decision-making, which automation uh, leads you to do that, uh, is, is that takes the personal biases away from your decision-making. And hence, the decision that's happening is completely uh, data-driven. And that's, I would say, the right way of also uh, taking, taking those decisions collecting data, running campaigns on those data, getting those data uh, insights of the consumer cohorts, creating those cohorts, and then, then personalizing those communication and messaging. So all these all these are tedious tasks. And all these in a, in a old world scenario would have required some uh, kind of more time consumption as well as personal advice would have come into play. So I think those two important factors to my mind has been completely eliminated and which gives us extra time to work more on understanding our consumer deeply, making our product more important, and also focusing on the after-sales service. A lot of the time, we marketers spend so much time in just acquiring the consumer, and we said, okay, once the transaction is done, I am out, I don't care about you. But the important part is that you have to retain this consumer. And I, I forgot the name, one of the gentlemen mentioned here, the consumer retention is, I mean, more important than customer acquisition. I mean, 
if you if you don't have a customer retention strategy and you're completely focused on consumer acquisition it's a leaking bucket you can keep the tap on all night but your bucket will never be full so i think automation gives you that extra time to focus on your product your consumer experience and bettering that and that that's that's a great uh, i would say space for marketer to play so both you and savish uh, agree on the consumer retention part of it that's more Vita, if i may yeah. just come in here on yes. a small point right i think there's two things that mukesh yeah. said right and i've been thinking about it which is both personalization and automation right uh, see i'll tell you while of course these are great tools at the hand of a marketer um and i'm also actually building on something that he said that at times it can get intimidating right like when you uh, when you personalize too much or even when you automate too much see ultimately marketing is art and science right if you just make it too science and forget the layer of art um, mm-hmm. and i think that's where at least i always feel that how do you strike the balance of personalize see ultimately if you could automate everything right uh the, especially the kind of personalization and automation that's happening we have all had cases where we are borderline irritated with how much automation has happened in marketing right so are you then taking the core of marketing and changing it from pull marketing to push marketing right i think that's one pitfall that i am always trying to watch out for um, mm-hmm. again this is all evolving so quickly there is no playbook right so we are all figuring things out for ourselves but i see a lot of brands where because you have the power to personalize and automate you can't suddenly say that i'll be so in your face uh, mm-hmm. that you know i mean i you either die or buy my product right it doesn't work like that you actually end up alienating the customer way more than you end up engaging with them so i think the fundamental principles of creating the pull the brand needs to have a certain kind of allure right i mean it can't be something that's just nagging in my ear all the time right i mean there the clues is the charm that a brand is supposed to have so i think totally agree with everything that mukesh said but i think that's one pitfall that in my head i'm constantly thinking about that what is too much right and what is not enough um, and i think that balance is so important because uh, sometimes you know technology is so powerful all of us are guilty of going overboard once in a while and i think uh, those those pitfalls are very very important to watch out for Yeah, and uh, it just reminds me. Of, sorry, just quickly share that. So <laughs> one of the very fun, fundamental uh, thing that we use in digital marketing is remarketing. Like if someone visits my website, I'll just remarket that guy. Now, as a marketer, because I'm utterly optimistic, I think that because he came to my website, he's interested in my product, and now I'll continue to chase him. While mm-hmm. the background story could be that he came to my product and said, "No, it's a shitty product. I don't want this," and then he moved out. but still i'm chasing him because as a marketer i'm saying okay he showed interest but it's like you know rejected it was a left swipe on me but yeah we we are habitual to that optimism do do we have a thought for that <laughs> then we we can figure out <laughs> shridhar rajdeep you can let us know no, no, i mean uh, going back to what sneha was saying and i think the problem of this uh, too much technology etc i think it's about to actually get worse right and of course you know i'm referring to the the g word which is generative ai and uh, people can't just stop talking about it right uh, while it is phenomenal technology there is enormous potential there's absolutely no doubt about all of that this is really going to be uh, life changing game changing whatever you want to call it um but again you know it has to be used and applied you know in the right context in the right way uh, mm-hmm. and you know the the, the fears you know given that we are still in a very nascent stage or already out there in terms of you know toxicity bias uh etc cetera, etc cetera, right uh we you know from a salesforce perspective one of the design points that we have you know uh, put in place you know in, with all the solutions that are coming out is is what we call as human in the loop right uh, ultimately as marketers i'm sure we all want to put a human face to the brand we want to treat our customers with empathy and so on and so forth and uh, you know automation all of this is only going to make it even worse right uh, mm-hmm. and with generative ai it's no different um, you can have a, a a bot or a gpt tool which can spit out responses and in fact the responses also are going to be very human like you know that's what makes it very different from the previous technologies uh, but what we've decided to do as a company is to uh, do what is called as human in the loop which means that any response before it goes to the customer Uh, a human will be in the middle and they will have to look at the response and see if it is appropriate or not 
for that customer and then only you know approve it and then send it right uh, so we are not going to give that level of automation where you know the gpt tool is just going to automatically you know spit out responses and what not but we will always have somebody in the middle taking a look at it changing the tone adjusting the formality of the response uh, making sure that you know the message has empathy built in you know especially if you are denying a loan or whatever the situation may be and uh, you know treat that person ultimately like a human being you know um, and I, and i think you know that's important to keep in mind as we uh, sort of you know use more and more technology tools uh, you know we need to recognize this problem as well yeah so uh, yeah rashid you want to come sure. in because yeah you know, i think i that you really interested in yes <laughs> So Nita, I think you know I want to give a very different perspective, right, to this conversation. I come from B two B marketing, and I got this opportunity to implement you know a marketing automation uh, full stack technology for three uh, big IT companies, right, in my life. So I uh, want to take you back to you know two thousand seven when I was working with uh, you know a, a big product company, and at that time uh, you know the customer journey was very limited right for a product it company most of the leads were coming from the websites events inside sales you know sales person calling email was a big thing right uh, for b2b market it still uh, is a big thing and cut to 2023 right uh, now customer is uh, you know leaving a lot of footprints right i mean on social media on there's so many b2b in b2b also there's so many channels which have come in right now uh, you know what Uh, marketers are doing with marketing automation not by implementing is is they are uh, you know balancing the power now right because the you know customer has uh, is leaving a lot of uh, digital footprints we need to balance it right and that is where you know marketing automation especially for b2b folks really helps so for us uh, you know if you look at a lead for us you know is in let's say an opportunity or what we you know in a b2b we call lead as a is a very important term uh, is you know right from capturing a lead to you know nurturing it to scoring it to assigning to a sales rep marketing automation has you know done a great job i know a lot of companies that once a person comes on the website and you know fills let's a uh, form and goes and reads a lot of stuff within let's say 30 minutes right a uh, lead is properly scored prioritized and goes to the sales, sits with the sales rep right and that is where you know you can uh, as shridha was talking about that human intervention can come in uh, but uh, you know after implementing uh, you know marketing automation for companies and also been using uh, you know i also want to say this as a lot of the panelists were saying that in the end the trust is built with a handshake right uh, so that is very important and your uh, you know the sign which you do on a contract is based on a lot of data uh and also with your gut feeling right so that is something which you which you can at present uh you know i would say the technology cannot take away where human intervention is required interesting right and since we are talking about technology and uh, shridhar also touched upon ai i i want to elaborate a little bit on that and you know get into the marketers as well uh the ai is obviously a tool which is kind of linked up to all that hype unlike metaverse which died down in a very big way uh what according to the marketers today i mean for present here uh, is the role of ai powered tools like chatbots uh, virtual assistants in enhancing customer engagement and overall improving uh, the customer experience um akash would you like to bring in uh, talk about this yeah i think um uh, it's a very uh, very very important thing when we are talking about and i have been a part of few startups now where this important getting the use, new users and the repeat users becomes very important so uh, and then there there comes a point where you need to understand how do you engage any customer uh, and that engagement uh, starts with acquiring a new user their overall journey purchase and then retaining once the purchase is done to retain that new, that customer to your uh, overall a uh, funnel or overall product is the overall cycle what everyone is aware about but how does these automations in chatbot or let's say a virtual assistant helps you is it one helps you to uh, identify which set of users you need to uh, acquire and what is the experience you need to deliver to the new users who have been onboarded uh the second is as soon as a customer purchases and i'm talking about basic uh, in a very 
basic language as soon as a customer is has transacted with you what are the line of uh, engagement you need to do with that customer to retain him back and this happens via a lot of chatbot uh, previously it was being said that uh, a human touch is very important for that overall uh, experience to be made but i think eventually everyone has realized that a chatbot is much more efficient and can answer almost everything and even give that touch of humanly touch and hence there are various fancy names coming to all the chatbots like a zr tia everything tata manabri has a tia name chatbot which has been introduced just to give that personalized feeling and the last part where i feel chatbot so three buckets one is how do you acquire a new user via a chatbot it can be just sending a whatsapp and then start talking to that user what exactly is that requirement whether it can be a push or a pull the user can come to your flow the second is once you have made that user believe that they want to purchase a product the product that the transaction happens and then you keep on chatting with that user in a very systematic way and not in an ad hoc way the last part is the overall experience of escalations how do you handle that so there are multiple uh, funny instances i come uh, prior to this i was in a food industry and uh, 25th of december 31st of december are the peak days and those chats were hilarious for us to read about everyone is talking about everything someone is talking about where is my pizza and the reply is this is your chola bhatura and this is how all the all the like this is how the shit hits the fan like the fan and you don't even know how to control that and then we got to know okay there is a ai tool there is a chatbot which can handle all your responses it can give you the exact answer the exact experience even if your systems are working at a 20x capacity is mm -hmm. where i think that overall chatbot mechanism helps you to retain the customer even when you are flooded with a lot of orders even when your systems are breaking but if your responses are very much uh, defined uh, the experience go, uh, the experience increases and hence a customer will come back to you uh, is where the automation comes into the picture the chatbots comes into the picture helps you discover order and retain back a customer you know, as a marketer, I'm sure chatbot works, but as a customer, I must say, lot it's there's still a lot left to be desired. I mean, I've yeah. literally banned bands of uh, brands because their chatbots were so infuriating and they did not answer any question that I asked. Yeah, and so the, I think <laughs> this is the good side of it. The the be if I want to be a devil's advocate, I think. There, because of automation, the chat gets abruptly ended. You don't even know what to do next. There is no call. There is no uh, CTR. There is no call. And you don't even, you just feel helpless. Like you're chatting, chatting, and then then there comes a message, automated message. Okay, uh, we didn't find a response. So, okay, thank you. I think your ex experience was great. So, I think those are the points where we need to get those manual intervention, the data sets to look at. Uh, understand ki okay this is where this is the pain point and it has broken the overall funnel the amount of money and time invested in acquiring retaining a customer exactly breaks from here and you will never go back to that brand again yeah. Sneha, what do you what do you uh, do you agree yeah, Nita, you know uh, i was going to add to what you said oh. you know, your frustration with chatbots etc and and this is again something that we see quite a bit uh, and i think one of the ways to address that potentially is to ensure that you know, the, the chatbot application or that solution, whatever it is, um, you know, that needs to talk to, let's say, you know, the backend customer service console or, you know, whatever software that, let's say, a contact center agent is using, right? Because there are going to be certain issues where a chatbot simply will not be able to solve the problem because it is just so complex. Uh, there are probably lots of uh, permutations and combinations to consider before I give you a response. And this is typically something that, you know, chatbots are still not able to do very well today, right? And therefore, it's important to ensure that that entire, you know, transcript or the history of what you've been sharing with that chatbot is something that, you know, you're able to save and then transfer it back to a human agent so that the human agent is, you know, able to look at that history that you just had over the past five minutes. And they don't start from scratch and say, okay, tell me what the problem is, right? That will frustrate you even more, you know? Absolutely. And I think that's where technology can help with, you know, integration, making sure that the data is there, 
you know those kinds of automations are you know available today you know uh, but but i do find that you know a lot of customers you know do not have even i would what i would call is you know fairly basic capability here right uh, either it just abruptly ends as uh, i think akash was saying because it, it can't go any further but the right thing would be to say sorry i'm not able to help you let, let me transfer to a human agent you know yeah. and then the human agent sees the transcript they know exactly what the problem is uh, they they kind of understand what it is and and then you know they are able to have a conversation and help you with that right uh, so i think you know th there are ways to address it but 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 you are right that uh, the the level at we are rich on an average i'm not saying there are some very good chatbots out there but mm. i think the average is still you know the bar is very low right now i think yeah. <laughs> i think we go back to that middle ground where you know you need to have a little bit of both technology and human intervention yeah Neha, what do, what do you want to right. say to so, Nita, I use a very simple rule when I think about any of these, right? It's a two-hour rule. Is mm. there evidence? And are you ready? Okay. Right? I think uh, just because everybody has a chatbot, do I really need a chatbot? I think a lot of times, and partly marketers are guilty of that because we sort of, you know, doing the next cool thing. Um, a lot of us are chasing that, right? I remember when Metaverse came, it was almost a PR worthy headline that if a brand launched something on metaverse, right? But to what right. end? Like, why are you doing it? Let's just start <laughs> it, a yeah. fundamental question, right? So is it relevant to you? And I think that's the first question you should ask whenever a new technology, whether it's chatbot. I mean, today everybody's going gungo about generative AI, but how does it really fit into my business, right? I don't have to use everything that AI is offering. If I just feel it's helping me out in content generation, then only use for that, right? It's, it's absolutely fine. And the second is like, I think everybody's saying, I think a half-baked job when you're not ready will actually alienate customers more than help your brand. Like you said, right? You're talking to a chatbot and then woof, they're gone. Like, what do you do now, right? You And imagine as a customer, you're so, so frustrated with that uh, situation. So have I done enough use case thinking, have I done enough journey testing before putting it in front of my customer? So I always feel that as long as you stay true to these two principles um, and work with that, so maybe use fewer technologies that are there, but whatever you're doing has to have a meaningful impact to your business and to your customer, right? Um, I think getting confused with everything that's out there is very easy. But I think that's also where we need to stop giving into the temptation and saying that, um, oh, it's working for them, which means it should work for me. It, unfortunately, life doesn't work like that, right? And businesses also don't work like that. So I always, every time I look at a new technology, I, I force myself to answer these two questions. Is it relevant? And as an organization, it's not about whether as a, I have the marketing intent to do it, right? Do I have developers to integrate it, right? Uh, do I have, is my CRM trainable to take over from when a chatbot conversation ends abruptly, right? So there's a lot of capability building that you need to do to work with new technology. And I think uh, those are the two principles that I think uh, I try to think through. I'm happy to hear if somebody else is using another principle and, uh, you know, help, helps me also assess these things in a better way. But yes, it's a struggle with the amount of technology that's out there. Uh, it's very tempting to get caught up in saying ki sab kuch karna hai, but uh, it's it's difficult. <laughs> Rajdeep, I mean, you obviously are more into B two B. Is there any way this is also addressing the problems to B two B customer then? Chatbots. So uh, I, you know, completely agree with Sneha. I think it's a lovely point, and I just wanted to comment after you know what she said. I think uh, you know uh, we all marketers also need to. Uh, uh, you know, think in terms of design thinking and in terms of UX that, uh, you know, if you have a chatbot, right, on your, that's on your website, is it really adding value, right, uh, to your, uh, you know, overall design, uh, you know, to audience? The second point, I think what Sridhar was also making is that your chatbot needs to connect with your contact database. It needs to pick information from there. So before, you know, if someone pings, the chatbot should know actually that you know what exactly is this person should know the 360 degree you know view of that person and then be able to recommend uh, you know a personalized context i think that is very important especially in b2b because uh, you know for our customers uh, can be from any industry right it can be a healthcare it can be you know from the telcos who come and you cannot just give one 
uh, statement, right? Or, you know, uh, let's say a selling point, you need to know the differentiator for that person. And then you need to be able to talk in human language. I think uh, we are not yet there when it comes to, you know, having uh, chatbots, uh, it, both in terms of UX, but I think the future is bright, especially with AI. I'm very excited that it will uh, bring in, uh, you know, new kind of technology for B2B marketers as well. You know, now I'd like to go back to personalization because I thought that was the most interesting uh, part of the discussion so far. I want to understand from each of you some winning practices with regard to personalization. Uh, what are the things that you keep in mind? What are the things that you avoid completely? And uh, yeah, what works and what doesn't? Can we, can we start with you, Akash? Sorry, I think there was a lag. You, you have to repeat yourself. I said, I want to know some winning practices with regard to personalization. How do you really go about it? No. Let me just rejoin. I think there is a lag. Oh, uh, okay. Do Mukesh, can we maybe uh, start with you then? And then we'll come back to Akash, if you could hear my question. Well, I mean, the first and basic uh, start of any personalization is understanding your consumer. Uh, same product can have different set of consumer at different life stages uh, with different motivation. So mm -hmm. segregating or building those cohorts of consumers where the uh, first principle of marketing will start. So the idea is so that you deeply understand your consumer, you break your consumer set into multiple cohorts, and then you address each of those, uh, those objectives, their pain points or need gaps and individually address through uh, communication and personalization. So I think every, everything starts from understanding your consumer deep down and uh, don't try to bucket everyone in the, in the same bracket. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that that's where it, that it, it starts from. Okay. Uh, Savish? Yeah, I mean, I mean, rightly, rightly said. Uh, so what I would like to say is, you know, there are certain things, certain principles which we must follow mm -hmm. for any kind of uh, personalization. I mean, what I feel that we must invest in data management, focus on data security, and adopt real-time data processing, mm -hmm. which becomes most important. And to manage all this, establishing a single customer view, mm -hmm. or create a unified customer profile that tracks interaction across channels, that becomes most important, and implement adaptive content strategy use AI machine and optimize it continuously. Mm -hmm. So prioritizing mobile personalization, because that also has to prioritize when what has to be gone becomes most important. So these are the few points uh, which I would like to highlight, which is most important, which I think. Agash, can we come to you now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there was a lag, extremely uh, regretful for that. Please tell me, yeah. Yeah, so tell me about your winning practices with regard to personalization. You spoke about so, how you have to be very yeah. tactful with regard to data. Yeah. yeah, I think I think uh, when it comes to personalization, medicine as a category or diagnostic as a category uh, needs the, uh, while all the segments require personalization and reaching out to the customer, but when it comes to medicine, you need the minutest of detail to reach out to the customer because uh, it's all a category play, which category you want to tap at what time, as I said previously also, and uh, in which period of the month or the year you want to tap them becomes very, very very essential which gender you want to tap which age you want to tap so if you have that level of cohorting present with you and if you can uh, add it on with the right level of communication i think that's the winning strategy what even we are trying to build and any any uh, marketeer or any business who was trying to build i think that cohorted approach at what what is the purchase power what is the uh, the pricing power, uh, whether a customer is discount centric, not discount centric, whether he is looking for the service, whether he is looking for the experience, or whether he is looking at a quick delivery, uh, mm -hmm. accessibility, quality, affordability, what you want to push across, bifurcate your user over there, get the right timing and the message to roll out to the customer. And I think that's the winning strategy. And, and you know, Sneha, Sneha, with regard to you, I think as a team brand, timing, mood, weather conditions, etc., everything makes a world of a difference in your communication, I'm sure. How do you go about personalizing your marketing efforts? 
it does but you know i mean these are still personalization from a brand perspective i think if you really want to personalize things from a consumer perspective customer journey continuity is to me a very basic hygiene principle right uh, first time visitor repeat visitor purchasers non purchasers right um, and crafting your message according to their journey and where they are with you as a brand i think that becomes more critical because see, you know a lot of these are assumptions i mean uh, don't people have tea in summer they do right uh, they might have it a little more in winters but ultimately these things are such a personal choice that as long as i'm able to understand things like what did they order last when did they order it would they have run out of their stock so hence is now the right time to remarket rather than doing a weekly blast which makes no sense to a customer um if they are a black tea consumer then what's the point of sending them green tea message right mm -hmm. uh, for example maybe they are a customer but they're actually not a tea customer maybe they're buying one of the ancillary products from the brand right uh, so i think understanding personalizing through the stage of the customer journey if i really had to pick one principle on personalization i think it would be that everything else just sort of is brand speak right that i think you should have more tea in winter and i think you should do this but that's actually not what the customer does Okay, Dr. Shridhar, I'd like to ask you how, according to you, can you better the brand metrics through personalization? Yeah, no, I think some great points have already been made, and so I'm just thinking, what can I add further to this? Uh, but I'm also reminded of a, a quote by one of my favorite authors, uh, you know, Seth Godin. I'm sure uh, in the marketing community, he's he's a sort of a legend and an icon. Uh, what Seth said is, you know, marketing is a generous act of you know solving. um you know someone's problem their problem right you're solving their problem so mm -hmm. if you look at marketing almost as a service uh and uh, you know putting your marketing efforts to address the issue that you have at hand you meaning the customer then i think that is personalization to me right um so if you keep that in mind then so how do i know what your problem is right if i have to address the problem i need to know, first of all know what your problem is right which again goes back to everything that has been said about this topic which is to really you know develop a foundation of that customer right creating a rich profile enriching that profile through constant you know collection of you know the digital breadcrumbs that they leave uh, on social media on all the channels that they interact with when they call you over the phone uh, you know any psychographic information you know i think we have to move towards psychographics from demographics you know for example right so the more i know about who you are as an individual um and and of course you know recognizing where you are in that journey right uh, are you still evaluating are you comparing are you mm -hmm. about to make a decision to buy or have you already bought something and now there is a problem at what stage of that uh, journey are you in and if you're able to understand that very clearly then i think you know there are very simple things that you can do to you know address the problem right um but i think personalization from a technology perspective uh, i think what it does really well is again what we talked about earlier which is the automation and scale part right um you know you can be a little mom and pop shop somewhere and you can greet customers with a smile and baby you even know their names you greet mm -hmm. them you exactly know what they're buying and that's what happens in kirana stores even to this day right yes. uh, you get a personalized service because they they know everything about you almost but uh, but what happens when you have 1000 stores across the country um it's it's very difficult to do that uh, you know keep that same level of personalization you know with the human touch but i think you know with the collection of data and with technology tools i think uh, personalization can be achieved at that scale but i think we have to keep in mind all the pitfalls that i think you know we spoke uh, we discussed you know a lot about you know in the past a few minutes uh, but but personalization at scale can be achieved with the technology um and i think you know that's where it really makes a difference in terms of uh, making it more consumer centric rather than being very brand centric right uh, because i now have the ability to mine uh, you know large volumes of data uh, that i have collected uh, and and then you know drill that down down to the level of a individual customers information uh, look at their past behavior their purchases the preferences likes dislikes a lot of these parameters can be captured today and mm. hopefully with that you have a reasonably good understanding of who that individual is and then you're able to cater to their needs right um so that that's what i would say you know in terms of personalization 
Rashdeep, would you like to add to that? Yeah, yeah, of course. I think, uh, you know, uh, as uh, Sridhar was also saying that, you know, customers actually giving us a lot of data, right? So it is our, uh, now it is important for us to, you know, personalize. Uh, but I think personally that, you know, if you have the power to personalize, that does not mean that you have to personalize every touch point, right? Uh, there has to be a sense to it. Uh, but, you know, when we, when I talk about my industry or, you know, for a tech, and when we talk to customers, right, our uh, customer can be a CTO, uh, who is probably a decision maker, CMO, who is probably has a budget, and then there are a lot of influencers. So I am actually reaching out to an organization, right? In that organization, there are people from different functions. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, what I also need to understand that, uh, you know, we talk about business to business or business to customer, but in the end, I am talking to uh, someone uh, is uh, probably with the, with the name Christopher or Nigel or Raj, right? So that is very important uh, for us to understand. And, uh, you know, when we talk about, uh, let's say, a lead uh, life cycle, so we have to see that where exactly we need to personalize. For example, if, you know, my sales guy is doing a social selling uh, and when it's reaching out to, let's say, uh, you know, a banking customer or a teleco, teleco customer, they need to 100% know the problem uh, of the industry. Uh, they need to know the problem of the company and also the particular function they are targeting, right? And then they need to personalize that conversation. Then only they'll be able to build that trust, right? So personalization is important, but depends upon where exactly in touch point you're doing it and do it with sense. Very, very interesting point. I like the part where you said don't personalize just because you have the power to do that. Interesting. Okay, and uh, you know, next, I wanted to uh, touch upon this. You know, sometimes marketers kind of get tempted to focus on vanity metrics like likes, comments, etc., which is a statistic that look spectacular on the surface, but don't necessarily translate into any meaningful business results. How do you avoid this trap and focus on the metrics that actually deliver? And what are the what are some of the vanity vanity metrics that you feel should be completely avoided? Can we start with Ms. Savish? Yeah. So for everything, you know, I mean, as rightly said by Sneha at the beginning, the two are principle, you know, you need to find that what is relevant for you and what is not. That becomes most important. Because I mean, many statements you, you find if you go to the social media site and whether liking it has any meaning or not, but the option only you have is the, is the like. You don't have, I mean, option to dislike in, in most of the social media platforms. So the only option you have is like. So even if you are liking it or not, and if you have to react, mm -hmm. the option available with you is like. So we need to uh, make a choice whether it's relevant for us and w what sense it's making to us. Mm -hmm. If we don't, if it doesn't make sense, there's no point in, in, in giving any, any reaction. Mm -hmm. So relevance of the thing becomes most important. And the first thing which we need to analyze what makes sense for us and what doesn't. And that's where the decision lies. And we take a call based on that. You know, on a platform like social media, Facebook, Twitter, what, what would be that one metric that would really be valuable, valuable say? Uh, for me, it's all. I mean, it's not that one gives um, makes a sense or give a value. It's all it's mix of things, but it depends. So I mean, uh, for one set of thing, uh, it could be LinkedIn. For one set of thing, it could be Twitter. Or for one one thing, it could be Facebook. But it depends. It's a situational thing. Which situational? Which sort of campaigns? Which sort of activity? Which sort of program we are running? At what point of time? And what type of customer category we are targeting? So if I talk about uh, the in, in industry in which I am in, so for me, if I'm targeting a farmer. For me, for me, Facebook makes more, more Facebook or YouTube makes more relevance as compared to LinkedIn because you won't okay. find a farmer going uh, going on LinkedIn and searching for a molecule that I have got a white fly in cotton and and which molecule to be sprayed. Mm -hmm. So there it becomes Facebook. But if I talk about uh, the, if I'm going to talk about the industry, if I'm uh, going to put uh, something in the forum for the industry like sustainability and all, there mm -hmm. LinkedIn becomes most important for me. And if I am going to talk about some policy matter or something, so there even Twitter plays a one of the most important role. So it's a situational thing that which sort of campaign, which sort of uh, uh, target customers you are targeting, 
So based on that, you need to select for the social media. Okay. Okay. Can, can we come to you, Kish, next? Yeah, sure. So clearly, yes, there are a couple of uh, <clears throat> uh, vanity matrices, uh, matrix that comes into play when we are doing a digital marketing because uh, as you discussed in the past, a lot of publisher, I will call it a lot of public publishers, a lot of uh, media houses try to uh, try to sell their own uh, inventory in a certain form and try to make your campaigns uh, work best and they throw some certain kind of numbers which they said is, is a success. Uh, but eventually, if you're trying to uh, make a sense out of those numbers. It may not lead or the journey, journey usually is very broken. Uh, mm -hmm. I would not say all these metrics are wrong or incomplete because as uh, Savesh mentioned, this also depends on the objective. If my objective is lead generation or conversion or specifically business ROI sales, then yes, maybe something like an impressions or a ad views may not be a very relevant because I don't want to build a top funnel, but I'm optimizing for the bottom funnel. Okay. Uh, but if I'm a newly launched product, newly launched brand, I'm just trying to get some awareness and top of the mind recall, then maybe an impression kind of metric is also relevant. Uh, however, I would say maybe there are some uh, certain things uh, which usually are maybe uh, I have come across are not uh, done in a proper way and can be considered vanity, like something, for example, like a, a say CTR. Now, what happens typically in CTR is that at a publisher end, they'll say, okay, there is a CTR of 2.7. But if I go to my landing page, none of this traffic showed up because those are accidental clicks. So while the click is happening, and now typically, for example, if I do a say interstitial ad on a app and they will make that cross sign so small in the corner that people are actually trying to cross that ad, but it's getting a click. So the, I mean, the publisher will come and say, see, we got you three CTR, 3% 3 CTR. But actually, you know, people are trying to cross that uh, <laughs> mark and they were just because we all are have. Uh, it's it's the same logic that you said. Uh, maybe people want to run away from my brand and you're yeah, showing people. I was trying it. to close that ad, but accidentally I just put it somewhere and it, it's a click. So CTR somewhere sometimes is used in a, in a negative way. Uh, traffic on the website. Again, sometimes you suddenly see there's enough traffic on the website. But then later you realize 85% of bounced off in say five seconds. Or uh, whatever. So, I mean, again, in numbers, those traffic looks really well, but if we didn't factor into the consideration, there was a 85% bounce rate. How many people actually spent time on the website? How many page views happened? Did they go to the, any specific product page and read about that? So maybe those kind of uh, engagement, maybe where I'm doing a time spent on the website or a page view or visiting any particular section of my website, which is like, for example, they checked on the price or they check mm -hmm. on where is my store. I can still attribute that maybe that guy was interested in my product and he's trying to find the price or the where I'm available. So those kind of metrics would be more important than the regular traffic on the website. Similarly for the impression, maybe if there is a more engagement on my ad, maybe that would be more relevant. So people liking, sharing, commenting, I still feel that maybe he has seen my ad. Because mm -hmm. again, sometimes what happens is that I'm reading a content and the ad is just running on the side. I would have never seen that ad, but it's shown as an impression because it's just loaded on the page. As soon as the home page is loaded, the ad loads and it counted as an impression. But I've never seen that ad, or maybe I just scrolled so quickly. Um, hmm. Video views, again, very notoriously said. A uh, lot of publishers, media houses say two or three percent, two or three seconds, uh, you are into the video, it's counted as a view. But hmm. two, three seconds, I was just trying to scroll through that and two, three seconds happened because they are auto played. It's mm -hmm. not that I purposely went there and played for it. It was an auto play format. I was just going through scrolling through the website, two, three seconds happened and they say, see, we generated a view. So again, mm -hmm. the through play kind of a metric which Facebook has implemented is only if it's a 15 second uh, into the videos, then only it will be considered as a view. So there are a couple of metrics which are at the first level are notoriously used sometimes. Which I mean, as a marketer, we have to slightly go deeper into that and say three second video views is a no for me. As long as it's a 15 second video, it works for me. Uh, CTR doesn't work for me as long as it's a, uh, completely uh, bouncing off my website. Traffic on the website doesn't make sense. So engagement, I think, uh, is largely the metrics which, I mean, as, as a marketer, we love to uh, follow that. If there's a communication, are people liking, sharing, commenting? Uh, communicating, is there, a, uh, is there a query answered? So those kind of things are taken into consideration. But as I said, every brand would have their separate objective. 
so i will not completely discard the impression as a metric is complete vanity maybe for someone it may work <laughs> okay and your your response has brought a big smile to sneha's face i'm going to her next <laughs> Yes. 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 Yeah. <laughs> uh, see, I also agree, right? Um, see, I mean, ultimately, if you think about it as marketers, there, there's, there are only so many levers and tools that is available to us, right? I mean, ultimately, I agree that engagement is the holy grail, right? Um, if people are taking out the time and putting in the effort to engage with you, you've done something right. Mm -hmm. But how do you get engagement if you don't get reach? Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, I at least have to, it's like... Uh, even in a uh, forget forget digital right in any in an offline environment if i don't tell 100 people who i am how will i make two friends right so i think engagement becomes a um, subset of how many people you reach so even if it's impressions reach etc cetera, etc cetera, i think people have to they're forced to chase it as long as they know that they're chasing it to ultimately drive the engagement tool and yes i mean those notorious crosses that are difficult to spot i mean you know um, you know I, I think those kind of practices just makes the job difficult and that mm -hmm. that just makes the industry infamous right which mm -hmm. i think as as collectively not just as us but also as um, ad sale property providers affiliates uh, you know property owners i think mm -hmm. there has to be a collective effort to not do those things because those few then just sort of end up killing the joy of actually getting impressions and reach right because then you're also always questioning ki, oh i'm sure it is a wrong click right you mm -hmm. know it's like, even if you have rightfully gotten a two two and a half percent ctr first instance whether internally or somebody in the team will say oh you know how it is right it's mostly 90 percent is just people trying to get rid of the ad and doing that so i think there will i hope there will come a time where all of us will grow above uh, these practices uh, but yeah i think engagement is the holy grail but you can't get engagement if you don't have reach right so it's an unfortunate truth but that's the truth the way i look at it no engagement without reach Yes. I also see, I think Deepak has joined us, Alembic Thompson Tools. Deepak, are you there? Mm, okay, he can't hear us, no problem. Let's move on to Akash. I think uh, while I agree to uh, others what they have said, but I think for me, and I know I, I'll get a lot of uh, eyes right now when I say this, but when I, when I as a marketeer, when I uh, look into one metric, what I need to chase, and while there are multiple metrics, there is CTR, there is views, reach, and obviously there are hypotheses or rationale behind that. We need to increase the reach. We need to increase the engagement. But the only metric that I, what I keep on looking every day and I keep on asking myself is my $1 value or one rupee value. If I spend a rupee, how much can I get out of it? And then I think it becomes very simple for me to answer a lot of things. So if I'm investing a rupee in, let's say, reaching out to X number of people or engaging Y number of people, how many of them will come and actually transact on me? And what is that value? What is that ticket size or what is the final price what I am getting by spending that $1 or one rupee? is I keep on asking myself and whenever we do a lot of whenever we do any pilot whenever we explore a channel whenever we want to expand it is the only metric I keep on pulling back uh, my mind or I think the entire team to answer this thing and automatically everything becomes very clearer because when you work in a high growing fast startup uh, your rupee value is the major key metric what people want to look at uh, everyone uh, tends to forget uh, what is the reach, what is the view, ultimately it boils down to the business, what you are trying to generate from that one rupee, what you have invested. And then it is just the matter of scale, how you want to reach. So if that basic metric is in place, I think a lot of answers, you get a lot of answers to the overall uh, direction where you want to go. And will helps you to build any channel any whether it is you want to increase the uh, likes you want to increase the views you want to increase uh, inorganic traffic in some various affiliate i think that really helps and then i just keep on asking myself 
did that one rupee make sense to me or should I have uh, not spent it? Mm -hmm. Or how do I get a better ROI or a OTR ordered through rate? I think th this, this is how it has been building engagement. Then there was reach and then there is OTR, which is your order through rate. What is the final order through rate with that one rupees what you have invested? Is I think the metric which drives me. They're pretty straightforward, actually. Uh, Shida, do you agree? And do you have anything else to add to that? Because you're on the other side of the spectrum. Yeah, I mean, you know, the way I'm looking at this is again, um, you know, I think all relevant points, and I think this debate about which metric is important, I think, you know, this is going to be a never ending debate, right? Because <laughs> different people have uh, different tactics and different problems to solve. and different metrics may you know help address those uh, challenges or problems uh, but for me from a technology perspective you know if i if i were to use you know e-commerce or dtc as an example right um, the the two big metrics that stand out are on one hand you have customer acquisition cost right which of course you can break it down into a lot of things you know traffic conversion etc cetera, etc cetera. but at the overall level you have uh, cac or customer acquisition cost on the mm -hmm. other hand, what I would call is customer lifetime value, right? Or CLV, right? Uh, and you need to have some kind of a healthy ratio. Uh, and in fact, I think there is a McKinsey study where they recommend that CLV should be at least, you know, two times, you know, CAC before you start, you know, scaling up, you know, for example, right? Which again, you know, may not be a universal formula. It's going to depend on the brand, what stage of growth you are in, et cetera, et cetera. But I think at a very fundamental level, you know, like I think... Uh, you know, even Mukesh was saying, um, you have some, you know, sort of a higher order metrics rather than, you know, getting mired into the very tactical impressions, reaches, clicks, et cetera, et cetera, right? At the end of the day, I think if you're able to follow the money trail, uh, then I think, you know, a lot of things will fall into place. And, and, and that is where, you know, from a technology perspective, in fact, we have a solution, uh, which is sort of a marketing intelligence tool, which essentially helps you to, pull all your marketing spends from various channels, right? It could be Facebook, uh, Insta, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. And then pull all of that in. And these metrics, again, that these platforms are providing, which are, again, walled gardens, they do it specifically in a way that, you know, it might be the same thing, but they just call it differently, right? That attribute is called X and the same attribute here is called Y. And therefore, one of the big challenges that we are trying to solve for marketers is to make sense of all of that and create some kind of a dashboard, which is very easy to visualize how is your marketing dollars, you know, performing, right? Uh, which is getting you a better rate of return, so to speak, right? And once you have that, then you are in a position to optimize, you know, rebalance your portfolio, pull some money off of this, reallocate it there, et cetera. But it looks at it from a money perspective, you know? So that I think is the sort of the, the sort of the switch or the flip, I guess. Uh, I'm not saying that again, you know, all the other metrics are not important, but if you follow the money trail, then I think, you know, it will kind of, you know, make sense. Um, and, and, you know, we, we have tools to do that actually, right? And uh, that's one of our most sought after tools is that because everybody think, look, I'm spending so much of money on all these platforms, but I'm not really able to make sense of which is giving me better return than the other. And how should I re-optimize? How should I re you know, balance my portfolio of spend? Uh, and, and I think that's an important question that I think marketers are, really you know grappled with you know because the the plethora of channels that are coming up you know it is just burgeoning and it's just going up and up all the time and uh, you know with a lot of budget constraints you know in today's environment you have to stretch that rupee and dollar even further right so how do you do more with less is a big <laughs> question mark i see a lot of smiles and laughs i mean you know these guys are you know actually the practitioners you know i'm on the other side <laughs> um, but but I think you know again you know technology I think can help to make some sense out of it. Okay, all right. You know, let me let me ask another expert on this matter. Ask the so uh, I think, uh, see, everyone has covered. I don't uh, think that there is any KPI which is left, but let me. It's bad to be the last person to be asked the question now. <laughs> let me go back to your question on you know one metric which I would avoid. Uh, and I think that metrics is going to be a uh, number of people attended the event, right? I think uh, if, uh, you know, someone tells me that, hey, you know, this is the KPI that, you know, these many people turned up on online or an offline event. So see for B2B guys, 
we are events are big size events right we spend a lot of money and then we don't expect a lot of people to turn up but someone mm-hmm. says okay hey, this is what but i think what we want from the event is that you know how many leads qualified right with the marketing qualified leads how many relationships we built right uh, in that event i think that's how we want to you know measure the performance of an event and not how many people turned up so that needs to be outdated but i think all the metrics are relevant as it is <laughs> and just thinking a parallel to that in in the online space and if i have to give that one answer what metrics i think follower base is completely uh, redundant how many followers i have on my facebook instagram because that's a dead real estate right uh, mr zukobaga has very smartly killed that real estate for the longest time we were just trying to build our follower base and then suddenly it's like no organic reach so i think that's that's the most uh, redundant information that what the follower base you have because anyways i'm not reaching it them organically Hmm. Okay, so now now I'm going to come to you first, Rajdeep. Give you that advantage. <laughs> What strategy, according to you, uh, is the one that should be followed to create a uh, high higher value content to be attract more leads and more customers? What what should work? Oh, that's an interesting uh, question, right? High value content for us. Uh, see, we uh, you know B two B marketers, we create a lot of content. What I have understood is that. uh you know one uh you know you should not try to sell anything in your content right to your people once you try try to just do that on the face of the content then it just backfires second mm-hmm. thing which i understand is that uh, you know people don't like to read right that is what you know if you're going to have a big white paper if you're going to have you know a lot of content for people to read unless and until that person is really interested to qualify you as a vendor and has to do a research and go to the boss and say that hey this is my analysis on the vendor the person mm-hmm. would not be interested right to you know uh, read a lot of stuff so it is very important for uh, you know marketers to come up with snackable content right which can be consumed really fast and for us in b2b the you know the video is something which uh, is very important and then we you know obviously have uh, a lot of tactics which we use uh, uh but then you know one thing another thing you know i i really believe and i always tell you know my colleagues is that uh when we are creating content we are not actually competing with uh you know our competition or you know i'm not competing with a professional service firm or an it company i am competing with netflix and amazon prime right because that is what my uh you know c- customer in the end also goes back home and looks at the content and if i have a video which is a very long video and just you know some fancy graphics and just talking about that hey this is a problem which you have right so let me just tell you the customer already already knows the problem uh, you know uh, the, the the customer is going through what you need to do is that how you want to solve that problem and uh, you know how are you different than others i think that kind of a personalization for b2b marketers is very important so stackable content uh, easy to consume uh, right uh, i think that is what uh, which we are experimenting now mukesh do you want to talk about this yes, yes i mean uh, content clearly it's it's the uh, holy grail of marketing these days in because we we are practically living in a digital or a screen Uh, world uh, creating content because we are now uh, everything is held the entire media is held in our hands so we have all the more power to skip the advertising as much as possible so the only way to engage consumer is to reach it through the content route and so certainly give your messaging or the product out a uh, couple of things that could be very important so while i would say in terms of the form factor i'll not comment on that because that keeps changing keeps evolving maybe it would have been a blog a couple of years back then maybe it would have been a uh an uh, in image maybe right now it's video i don't know what it would be as down the line it could be something else so that i think marketers we have to keep our eyes and ears open to those trends that what is the form factor maybe right now we can uh, easily say that maybe it's the video which uh, has the highest engagement uh but in terms of the couple of things that we can uh, look at which we can only try to do that because again that's also one of the challenge as all marketers we want to create viral videos right uh, our first wave to the agency is that we need a video that should go viral every consumer to share uh, should share that with their friends and family uh, but that doesn't easily happen one of the thing that should be is that there has to be actionable insights uh, sometimes what happens that those those insights or those lessons in those videos sometimes get like slightly more preachy which i think okay okay this is not for me uh, 
so if I'm able to have those practical, actionable insights in the video, uh, consumers, there's a greater likelihood or probability that I'll relate to it or, or maybe I'll try to implement it in, more, uh, in my own personal life. Two, uh, this is again my theory is that uh, the another approach of making it practical is using the uh, right set of people in the videos. And that is, I believe, essentially the reason why this entire influence of marketing exists. I mean, Shah Rukh Khan still exists. Salman Khan still exists. Why do I need a guy next door selling a face cream or a, or a live voice hook? Is that I relate to their lifestyle more than what I relate to Shah Rukh Khan. If tomorrow a celebrity will come and sell me something, I can see through that that maybe his lifestyle is different. This product will not work for me because my lifestyle is different. But when I see a certain guy who's my age, who belongs to my city, who wears clothes like me, who has my skin tone, and if he's saying that this works for me, I might feel it more relatable. So the content has to be more relatable as well. It will look more closer and say, okay, okay yeah, maybe it may work on uh, Shah Rukh's skin, but may not work on my skin. But here, if I think that this guy is the same guy, he works, his lifestyle is the same as me, he works, his sun exposure is the same as me. So maybe this sunscreen can work on his skin. It may also work on my skin. So having those actionable insights, as well as those practical, more relatable approach in uh, through content, I think those those two factors uh, uh, will maybe is, is the next leg of content creation, and that's where my I think that why uh, the celebrities maybe lost some of their uh, sponsored money to the to the influencers and influencer have that uh, head start because they are able to work very closely to the consumer. You know, also, I think because they're celebrities, they are much more on this. And I think that Alia Bhatt episode explains this pretty well, where she obviously endorses fruity and uh, then she came on record saying that sugar is a strict no-no. Yeah. <laughs> so that just was like, everybody called her out. And uh, for the influencers, I think while they're also becoming big stars now, uh, the scanner is... Yeah, also, also because, I mean, what social media has also done is that unlike earlier when I would know about a celebrity only through his movies. I would not know what Amitabh Bachchan or Ranveer Singh is in his personal life. But now through social media, I know what his lifestyle is. So I can clearly find out that he may not be using the Lal Dant Manjan tail or whatever, Colgate or whatever. So I can see through that. But if tomorrow he comes on the screen and sells me Dabar Lal toothpaste, I can see that he's, he's faking. So, I mean, now the consumer are more aware because your personal life is also out on the screen. So it's also very difficult to have both personality at the, at the same time. Let's see. And, uh, Sneha, how do you, what according to you, what, how do you create that higher value content? Is it big investment for you or is it just smart investment there? Um, actually, it's a mix of both. But actually, you know, one point that I want to address from what Mukesh said, um, mm -hmm. I do feel that influencers are also now headed the celebrity way. Right? Because <laughs> I mean, my life is nothing like Masum Mina's Wala's life right so then where is the relatability um, mm -hmm. I do, and I think that's why one of the new terms which I absolutely sort of uh, live by is the difference between a creator and an influencer right I think if you really want to create relatable content then I think it's the creator that you need to go to but then mm -hmm. be mindful of the fact that if you're going to a creator whose expertise is creating content and not influencing people right you will have to spend the media dollars behind it Right? wherein an influencer gives you the content plus also gives you a certain reach. And similarly, if you go to a celebrity, they give you the content plus they also give you more reach. I'd love to have examples of creator, your influencer and a celebrity. <laughs> a celebrity would be an Alia Bhatt. Um, a large influencer would be uh, a Masu Minawala. And right now I'm talking fashion. Um, and a creator would be a girl living in my building who just loves to put looks together or a stylist on like a junior stylist on a movie set, right? Who's great at putting looks together, can source the right things, put them together, tell you how to pair a jeans with a certain shirt. But they, she may not have a million followers, right? She'll probably have five, 10,000 followers on Instagram. So you're not going to her to just get to those 5,000. You're going to her so she can create the right looks for you that how to create 10 looks from three garments, for example, let's say if you're a fashion brand, right? How do you then use that content, which is very much authentic because she'll use things that people like you, you know, like I would be buying 
not designer wears, not things that are sponsored for me, right? And yet I'm taking three pieces of garments and able to put 10 looks together, right? Styled it differently. And then I'm willing to put the media money or the reach money behind it from my platform, right? So I think that's how I differentiate between a creator and an influencer. Uh, so I think coming back to that, so I do feel influencer marketing at some stage is getting very mixed with celebrity marketing and we need to be a little bit of care, a little bit careful there. But coming to what format works for me, uh, see, I think it depends on the stage of the funnel. Mm -hmm. I think big announces, in my view, still work better with big format content. Okay. Right? If you are a brand and if you're launching a new category, a new market, doing 10 influencer videos is not going to cut it, right? I mean, you have to do justice because if you've put in so much effort into developing a product, packaging, launching, supply chain, blocking your working capital, then give it the due marketing effort that it needs. So I now that can be a celebrity, non-celebrity. Uh, I mean, see, we, we talk about digital content. One of the most viral things on digital ever was Zomato billboards. Sorry, I didn't catch so Zomato that. billboards. Ah, yeah, of course. They're not digital content, right? Yeah. They're static content that just went viral on digital. They were not designed to go viral on digital, right? So I think just because you are seeing it on digital, it's not digital content, right? But I do think that big announcements, big launches do deserve big ticket mm -hmm. content um, uh, platforms. Uh, mm -hmm. When it's your day-to-day, -day, I think doing more authentic content, doing more testimonials, answering the questions that your customer are actually asking you. Mm -hmm. right? For me, that works. You can use simple text. You can use animation. You can, you know, you and I can sit in front of a camera and say, hey, here are the five questions about the brand that I'm answering. It can be as authentic as that. So I, I feel those are, the, those are the two buckets that I would look at. Very divergent views. Very interesting. I think... Uh... We have Mr. Chobe back with us. Yeah, I'm sorry. I had to <laughs> for an important call. Uh, it was unavoidable. Um, I'm here back for you uh, guys. And uh, I really missed a lot. I'm sure I'll have a recording session of this uh, to learn a lot. I was uh, I was really impressed by the talk uh, just uh, Sneha did. Uh, and it was really impressive. You know, uh, what is really important is authenticity. You know, market is all about superficial. I mean, we are here, you know, sometimes there's a, the, 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 you know, I remember a BBC interview of Amitabh Bachchan and the question was asked to him, uh, you know, tell me how real when you, how real are you when you act? So, unka jawab tha ki, you know, uh, I have father's figures. I have fathers in most of my movies and mm -hmm. at times they have to die. And I'm not sure, you know, the way I cry in the movie, I'll cry in the same way uh, when my father will die. So, uh, you know, so the kind of, uh, see, digital, I always believe, you know, it's like uh, human beings are always meant to talk what they are not. And on top of that, when you give a virtual platform, it becomes so very uh, easy for create things superficially. Uh, misguide the uh, you know the communication the effort the 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 communication and it trends so very fast it is so very difficult to control that environment so you know I I, I would like to answer the very same question which was I was been asked uh, uh, you know uh, the question to me was that how do the personalization works here you know that was a question uh, please help me with understanding my question uh, probably I would be if you have time I would like to address or uh, say a few words could you please repeat my question just a second yeah um, so how, how has personalization, uh, you know, emerged as a critical strategy for you today and how do you leverage the targeted strategies in your uh, organization to improve metrics? So, um, you know, when it is a first time configuration, let's say, you know, uh, uh, when you're launching your product first time, mm -hmm. it is definitely your uh, intellectual, uh, uh, you know, your intellect, intellect your experience, which will help you configure the campaign. Mm -hmm. And uh, what then happens next is that the data keep pumping in. You have today data coming in in terms of what time in a day, what screen size, what medium, what channel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it keeps floating. 
the data comes either in structured format or it comes in unstructured format. We have tool mechanisms which actually helps us to understand, you know, uh, how exactly your campaign is being consumed across different uh, set of people, segments, and TGs. And hence, you know, uh, in, in a very fast uh, track, I personally believe maybe uh, when, when you're three days down the line or maybe two days or 48 hours down the line, you have relevant data to personalize. For example, um, you know, I can very well customize and personalize that uh, you see my uh, content on Facebook, on uh, your tablet or MacBook or Air, um, iPad uh, between 9.30 to 7.30 p.m. Mm -hmm. And that's what the customization uh, or personalization happens. So I have a rule base which is associated to either a product or a consumer. And that rule base is being captured very well with uh, you know automations tools like this. These are very simple rules which are being created, which can be created, uh, and 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 then hence start building up and kind of an personalized recommendation engines. How does it happens to you? You know, like uh, you are there today. Very simple example. I was really, I mean, people could uh, talk like this. Uh, that they this think about this as a friction. We are with sitting with Alexa. Uh, Alexa is doing nothing, and uh, we are talking about, uh, let's say, uh, a new sofa. Mm -hmm. And you have an Amazon ad coming to your mobile. Uh, you know, uh, thirty percent discount or fifty percent discount. So, uh, you know, the customization and personalizations is happening from different source of data, which has been accumulated from different sources and a course of time. Definitely first time it has to be configuration, but moving forward, uh, the data is accumulated and it get associated uh, with individual or a product, which can be used in the next communication for highly customized and personalized communication. And that is how we do the strategy in terms of, uh, uh, you know, in promoting right product to the right person in, in a very, very right format by very personalizing it. That is how we practice it here in Metropolis. It's a continuous process, obviously. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for those points. I know what I really want to touch upon is, is you know, last year we saw this modelist uh, ad, uh, Good Luck Girls, which was where it, uh, the brand upcycled one of its most loved ads from the past, you know, where Kuch Kha says in the uh, You know, while that was an expensive proposition where you recycled it, upcycled an old ad, uh, I'm sure there are cheaper alternatives, equivalents on digital. You know, one of the, like, just to break it down, one of the key strategies nowadays is to scale digital marketing ROI by upcycling, which is also known as creatively reusing your older pieces of content and then re-promoting it to the audience. Uh, I'd like to understand from each of you how much are you using it and what challenges are you facing, you know, while upcycling this content and, you know, how what is the way to go about it? Uh, can we start with you, Sneha? Yes. Um, so I'll tell you, Nita, in reality, I mean, we do upcycle, recycle a, a lot of content. Uh, I think we can do a lot more mm -hmm. and I'll tell you the real challenge is actually not external it's internal okay right because as a brand you are living breathing seeing your content 24 7 right and you feel that oh my god ye to, like this is oh, this a month old right how can I reuse it again the customer has forgotten okay. Okay. the customer has forgotten you right 30 days is too much in a customer's life to really be bothered and say oh my god you know I saw the same social post from this brand a month ago doesn't happen so I think most of the times it's it's the team's hesitance uh, to say that oh no no uh, you know we must create new content so that we remain fresh in the eyes of the customer. And I keep telling them that we give ourselves way more importance than the customer does, right? I mean, they're not, their life is not revolving around our content presence, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that I've realized is sometimes um, repurposing a lot of uh, written content into animated videos or some smart snackable format is a great way, right? Because so much customer testimonial is coming your way. Uh, mm -hmm editorial headlines right i mean they make for great uh, uh, performance ads right if i can really capture x publication wrote this y line about you call it impact <laughs> absolutely right and you know anita from impact reviewed my brand and said wow it's the only tea brand i ever want to drink right i mean that makes for great uh, ad content for me so i think it's not just about old on your content it's about looking at everything that the customer is saying about you 
uh, just keep reusing it. See, I think in the old time, a brand would typically make one or two films in a year, right? And they would keep putting TV money behind it. And there was a concept of frequency and GRPs that you were driving. The principles still work. Mm -hmm. So thinking that you have to put out one new post every day, sometimes I actually question, why aren't you driving frequency? Why aren't you taking the same post and saying, I'll put it on social, I'll put it on performance, I'll put it on YouTube, I'll make it my emailer copy. Uh, I mean, if I have a summer recipe, right? Mm -hmm. It should go on every medium that I have. It should mm -hmm. go on my emailer. It should be a download option on my website. Um, I should print it and put it in my, dis you know, dispatch packages and do everything, right? So I think it's it's just about, if you go back to the frequency principle, which is so critical in marketing, I think you'll be forced to recycle and upcycle your content. And I think that's one way that I sort of try to tell my team on how to think about it rather than get caught up in this. See, it's not outfit of the day. So mm -hmm. don't get caught in that metric that I have to create something new every day. If you have a strong message, say it a hundred times, mm -hmm. right? Because if it's a relevant one, the customer will relate to it more. Makes sense. So big thumbs up from you for upcycling. And uh, <laughs> let's get to, Vakish, what are the challenges that you face while upcycling content? Yeah, so I mean, I completely agree with Sneha. There are honestly uh, uh, no challenges as long as we are not a cult brand. See, I mean, someone like a Cadbury who did that 90s, recreated that uh, video and all that because they have to live up to those expectations because maybe it was a cult advertising, everyone's seen about that. But if your advertising are only seen by a million people on the digital, uh, actually it cannot be in rightful sense called upcycling. It's just that you're creating another piece of content which is kind of similar messaging and very mm -hmm. honestly in an FMCG company like I'm an edible oil and every mm -hmm. communication is largely the same it's just maybe the celebrity I'm using is changing or maybe the home I'm using is changing but largely it's the same I mean unlike I'm not a technology I'm not a smartphone that every year there's an upgrade mm -hmm. uh, my positioning is largely same I'm, I talk about health I talk about uh, nutrition I talk about taste and it's pretty much the same so maybe upcycling if I look from that lens, in terms of communications, pretty much the content is same. Uh, is that sometimes when you're doing a big ticket television campaign, you just try to refresh it. I would mm -hmm. say refresh would be the better term and communication pretty much remains the same. I'll have maybe a new celebrity who would be uh, more relevant at that point of time and try to build that. Otherwise, up, uh, I mean, upcycle or recycle the content would be very, uh, it's actually also relevant for the people who has built something great in the past so that people have that memory of that That's that good. people can still think of that uh okay that was some campaign in the 90s i can still recall but if you don't have that cult uh this thing it's even as, as a marketer if i think i'm trying to create a recycled content for a consumer it will just appear as a new content because they may not have a history to it <laughs> you know i'd like to come to <laughs> the chove like i'd like uh, Mukesh, who, you know, who spe specified that as an edible oil brand, there's not much uh, varied communication he can do with regard to upcycling. You know, you, on the other hand, have much to offer in today's age. There are so many diseases coming up. So you can try all those options. So tell us how, what are the challenges that you are facing in this upcycling process? See, see I'll tell you, um, our industry, especially, you know, it, it is not a commodity market and our products are not commodity market. You have to refill your stock. My communication and my offerings to the consumer is not like, you know, Neha, come, uh, I'll give you 50% discount, get me pricked two times. I'll not give you two time pay. So, you know, and neither you will come for it. So for us, actually, you know, hitting hard on, on consumer mindset with the repeated communication, but only the flavor need to be changed. So for example, we are struggling today with respect to, you know, uh, with, with, we are working with a couple of very good agencies and we are working with uh, uh, some of the big consultants in the industries to change the mindset, uh, mm -hmm. bring a revolution. Uh, fortunately, I was a part of the revolution of Apki, yeah, this one, Geo, wherein the perception of uh, using data as a perfume drops, then uh, using a data as a municipality tub open the tab whatever data you want to take it so i was mm -hmm. part of that journey and uh, today uh, with that mindset changed the, there is a science behind changing that mindset it's a the, very rightly said by the forum you know it's a repetitive 
content which is the same content which has been promoted to you in such a fashion in your subconscious mind it has been hated again and again so we are struggling today and we are working towards one particular concept ki unlike you service your car you have to service your body so you know uh, it is so important for proactive precautionary preventive uh, health checkups uh, it is so critical for you and the content we use believe me or not we try to hit the same communication through different channels to the same customer making it trying to do something different either by uh, the communication the line of communication is same sometimes uh, emoticon sometimes and cartoon sometimes and uh, video sometimes and messaging sometimes and endorsement sometimes and um, you know a celebrity talking about uh, you know it's important to get an preventive health checkup or something thrice in a month at least once you should so it is very critical at least in my industry we know that you know um, we have only one thing to offer which is uh, illness or wellness two things to offer wellness and illness and uh, sorry we don't offer that huh? we give <laughs> solution for <laughs> we give solutions for and mr um, i think um, one mg mr uh, i don't remember him akash i think he is also remember uh, we, i think for him also it's a similar kind of a, this is we are into the cure of illness and wellness so we really have to use this contents n number of times uh, to the same customer sometimes he gets irritated you know uh, we we often get a problem of blocking those whatsapp numbers and call center numbers uh, but we don't uh, stop we still communicate we are confident that you know some day person will definitely understand and we get trends actually believe me or not we get trends people proactively asking to the, i have gone through your content it really had opened up my mind i really have to take care of my diabetes i really have to take care of my you know malfunctioning of kidney so mm -hmm. you know they they talk and they recollect that particular communication and that works for us mm -hmm. rashti what is the kind of advice that you would give to all the brands with regard to this you know how much does it really help the bullseye the subscaling business with yeah i think to i and uh, all the conversion metrics so i think uh, yes uh, repurpose uh, in upskilling content we do a lot in b2b marketing as well yeah. uh, and you know a general tactic is that if you are coming up with a point of view or a thought leadership say for an industry you will come up with a paper and then you will convert that into you know different kinds of content right it can be a video it can be a a small content can be an email so it can be you know various forms of content and when uh, there is a need right uh, we uh, always use it uh, again i think but there are two uh, things which uh, we keep in mind is in terms of the quality of content that uh, you know a repurposing it a lot of times sometimes dilute the quality so that's where in b2b we uh, you know focus and make sure that does not happen and the other thing you know which i personally focus on focus on is is called content fatigue right uh, for uh, my audience to make sure that you know i'm just not throwing the same kind of content to them again and again and you know very similar to how uh, you know a stand up comedian would uh, you know retire a joke right mm -hmm. after a some time uh, i think it is important for us also to see that we you know retire the content and do not just keep telling the same differentiator right um, to the industry and client so that's what you know and b2b which i follow thank you okay uh shridhar would you like to have something to that uh, no i mean i think this is not a this is not a domain that i uh, have a lot of uh, perspective on so i'm going to you know pass this <laughs> all right we'll move on you know also uh, what are the best practices uh, to maintain brand consistency across all your digital campaigns i think that's the biggest ask for all marketers today you want to have that one flow and that consistency uh, let's let's quickly start i'm sure everybody can give me one point each uh, let's start with you sneha uh i think the one factor nita is persistent persistence right because it's very difficult with brands you know on digital you're rolling out a campaign probably every month or every quarter right it's really difficult to come up with new ways of saying the same thing right because consistency is about saying the same thing pretty much looking the same but looking different right so i think just being persistent not being lazy about it um and also i think uh, somehow not getting uh, uh, caught up in creative ideas you know because oh this is trending we must do this but does it take me away from what my brand has been trying to say 
I think uh, the if I can think of one word, it's persistence. It's very hard. You have to keep pushing people back, saying no. You know, we'll only do this when we have the right uh, message or campaign, which makes you same but different. Uh, mm-hmm. Versus getting caught up in these trends and hashtags and things like that, uh, which is important. But if if your objective is to be consistent, then uh, uh, just just stick to it and don't give in to the pressure or it, it can be timeline pressure. It can be creative partners pressure. It can be business pressure. Uh, so I think that is the one uh, sort of rule that I think I would use. Rajdeep, what would you say? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, what we do in, uh, you know, our organization is that, uh, you know, we uh, are um, very particular about the brand guidelines, right? So be it the salesperson, be the account manager, be the marketing person or the inside salesperson or, you know, whatever we put on digital or email uh, has to have consistency, right? And how we, you know, we, we talk and what we are pitching to our customers. So for example, if the, you know, the ambition of my company is building a better working world, uh, the, the, the key message, right, which we want our uh, customers to know or how my uh, campaigns look in terms of visually, uh, that is very important that, you know, that uh, uniformity and consistency of the brand needs to come out. And uh, with having a set brand guidelines, having style guides, uh, and making sure that it is in the DNA of the marketing and sales team when they go out, uh, they follow it. That is very important. If you're able to do it, then most of the challenges you'll be able to solve in terms of uh, you know brand consistency. And and this Chobe, I think Mukesh will come to you next. I think Chobe has just got a call. Was he? Okay, Mukesh, uh, what what do you basically follow with regard to brand consistency? How does it really improve your metric? Uh, you follow so- the same. I'll, I'll give two instead of one. Uh, I think first is knowing your consumer and second is uh, being married to your positioning. Mm-hmm. Uh, see, mm-hmm. platforms of advertising formats, communication, script, faces will keep on changing. And mm-hmm. the brand also needs to evolve with time. Uh, as I was talking maybe today, right now it's the digital. I'm trying to create a lot of reels on Instagram, I'm trying to create an article on website, I'm trying to create a static or a holding on offline channel. So my form of advertising will change and I'll have to adapt to that particular format. I cannot be producing long content on Instagram and short format on YouTube or vice versa, right? So I have to play as per the format. It's like very in Rome dress like a pope, right? So I have to adapt to those specific platforms. I have to keep that communication and messaging relevant. But as long as I know that what is the positioning of my brand, what do I stand for? I will never go away from my uh, my DNA or my proposition. Mm-hmm. Every messaging, every script, every copy, every line, every statement that I'll do, I will know it lead back to my proposition and my positioning. And two, as long as if I know who's my consumer, again, I'll not miss out. It's not that on Instagram, I'm trying to target a 17 to 18 year old. And on YouTube, I'm trying to target a 30 to 40 year old. No, if if I know my TG is there and who's my TG, I'll try to make that content relevant for that particular. And there maybe sometimes I'll just skip certain platform, which I feel mm-hmm. that maybe it's not relevant for my uh, consumer. As maybe Sneha was mentioning that we should not do things just for the sake of doing it. I'll not do metaverse or AI just for the sake of because that's the new shiny toy in the arsenal of a marketeer. But if my consumer is still reading newspaper, I would still happy to do newspaper advertising. I'll not go to metaverse. So knowing my consumer, knowing my positioning will help me stay consistent across whatever things keep changing uh, in the rapidly changing world that we are right now. You know, like Mukesh said, you know, without losing sight of your TG, you're trying to adapt to different platforms and doing the best that you can offer there. Uh, uh, Mr. Chobe, how do you, you know, for a brand like a healthcare brand, how do you personalize this and make sure that communications have their uh, have that underlining thought and the uniformity and yet have that diversity with regard to communication for that particular platform. Uh, you're on mute. Yeah. I'm sorry. So, you know, in our context, we use tools. I mean, uh, there are a lot of automation tools to do the personalizations. Uh, reason being, uh, you know, again, uh, I'll be very honest with you. I've been in industry from almost well, quite a time. I was fortunate to work with a few of the best peoples. But uh, 
actual marketing I feel that I've done in medical industry. I mean, this is where we actually do my, uh, marketing because, uh, you know, uh, it's not easy to do marketing for, uh, for, 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 for products which are not commodity. It is supposed to be a need-based requirement and things like that. So uh, I just, we use a lot of automations. We use tools to, uh, you know, ensure that uh, you know, a TG is being very clearly articulated. I just can't go scientifically wrong with my communication mm -hmm. uh, and, and to the right, uh, to, the, to the specific TG. So we use uh, uh, tools to ensure a lot of, we, we use data mining tools to do test mining, uh, profiling, uh, communication mapping, uh, relevance, um, you know, doctor validations, and then we try to ensure that the uh, right channel uh, is being as right com customers are being communicated in the, with the right uh, communication through right channels. So you know because there are a lot of medical legal uh, issues also which can come into. Uh, we we also have uh, we can't over promise. We just can't uh, uh, you know under promise something. Uh, we talk about numbers and ratios which are uh, del delging with your life and parameters. So we 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 really use a lot of. Uh, uh, AI tools to make sure that you know we get that consistency uh, across a particular uh, subject, domain, uh, mm -hmm. or disease, or portfolio, and then try to have uh, the channel, uh, the, the communication uh, aligned in a right format. Okay. Well, now I think, uh, Mr. Shida, do you want to? Uh, you know, I mean, the, the word that comes to my mind is, you know, authenticity, right? I think, again, when I look at my own company that I work for currently and some of the others I've been involved in in the past, uh, I think, uh, and, and they've all been, you know, great brands in their own right. And for me, I think uh, being authentic, uh, being uh, true to your own, you know, core values of the company and uh, who does it matter to because you can't cater to everybody, right? Yeah. Um, there are only going to be a subset of people that will ultimately, you know, their worldviews will align with yours. And that is where a connection happens. Uh, and I think, you know, from a branding, advertising, marketing perspective, I think if the authenticity comes through in every thing that you're doing, you know, your messaging, your positioning, uh, like, for example, in Salesforce, you know, trust has been a number one value since the company was, uh, you know, started way back in 1999, right? And uh, it's kind of you know uncanny that in, in today's world, uh, I don't think there's anything more important than trust. You know, with all these concerns about privacy, uh, you know, GPT, Gen AI, you know, toxicity, bias, data privacy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? The number one thing that again matters today is you know what are you going to do with my data? Right? Um, mm -hmm. Is the value exchange you know transparent? Is it clear? You're asking me for a lot of information so that I can personalize that information for you. But how do I know that you know you're not going to misuse it, right? So I think it all comes back to trust. And I think uh, if uh, brands you know stay true to those values, uh, it may not be for everybody, as I said. But you know for some people it will uh, appeal, and I think that's where the the sort of the you know the magic happens. I think. Yeah. So. You know, you said something very interesting. You said nothing. There's nothing more important than trust. I would like to add. There's nothing more tricky than privacy <laughs> <laughs> for the marketer. So yeah. I promise this is my last question to all the marketers here. Uh, you know, how do you basically balance uh, the two, you know, innovations that digital uh, industry provides and, you know, that growing need for consumer privacy and lockers, cookies, we've seen, the norm, see, we've seen them all. So how do you as leading marketers tackle both and, you know, try and create that balance, to make sure your brand is light? Uh, can we can I go first on that, uh, Nita? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, th I think, you know, the way I look at it is that, um, there is obviously a fine line. I think we've discussed this uh, earlier as well uh, between you know personalization and privacy. How far do you push that line? Uh, and I think you know again, it's it's different for different brands. Um, you know, some may choose to be conservative, some may choose to be a lot more adventurous. You know, so to speak. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think customers you know are willing to part with a lot of information about themselves, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but um, and and they'll do it willingly if they know that they're getting something beneficial in return from them that is you know personalized to them etc cetera, etc cetera, right uh, and this is what we call a zero party data right where even going beyond first party zero party is where customers are willingly giving you information about who they are their likes preferences etc cetera, etc cetera, right and mm -hmm. i think the value exchange you know if brands can get it right they can make it very transparent well i'm asking you for this piece of information 
this is what we're going to do with that information, right? Hopefully the offer or the, you know, the, the discount that I'll give you or the, uh, the loyalty program incentive that I will offer you will be much more in line with what you expect, right? Maybe it's not points, right? Maybe it's a, uh, it's, it's a free lunch at the, your favorite restaurant, for example, right? That may mean a lot more than the 500 points that you're giving them. So I think uh, as, as long as brands are able to uh, make that clear, then I, I really think, you know, privacy is not really that big of an issue, at least in the minds of consumers. Of course, as an enterprise, which is collecting a lot of consumer data, you have the responsibility to safeguard it, ensure that it doesn't fall into the wrong hands and it is not being abused and so on and so forth. But beyond that, I think from a consumer standpoint, I think they're okay with sharing data as long as they know that, you know, they're going to benefit out of it. Uh, Mr. Singh, would you would like to add to that? Uh, you know, Mr. Rajdeep Singh? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, for us, uh, you know, when it comes to privacy and innovation, uh, you know, privacy is, is very important uh, because, you know, just think about a tech company, right? And our, uh, you know, main customer base, if it is based in Americas or Europe, uh, till the time you take care of, you know, the privacy of the customer, it is nearly impossible for you to run a campaign, right? So there are a few, let's say, countries in Europe, right? Uh, and without a written consent, you can't even send an email or call them, right? Otherwise, you're going to be in trouble. So uh, privacy comes first for B2B marketers. And then, uh, yes, uh, innovation is always there we have to find a way, right? Like in Jurassic Park, they say that life finds a way, like the same way that a marketer has to find a way with innovation. Uh, but yes, privacy is there is no uh, negotiation on it. So Mr. Rajiv Singh says privacy comes first to uh, B2B marketers. What about you, Mukesh? What, what happens for a B2C marketer? <laughs> yes, I mean, uh, because before marketer, I'm also a consumer. So I cannot say uh, no to privacy. I think it is uh, an important topic. Uh, Honestly, I would not say that I uh, know about it all and I can uh, tell you what should be done. I think there are more educated and more uh, worthy people who can take a call on that. Uh, but yes, the way things are going right now, I think this, this requires some balance. Uh, maybe right now, I don't know, India usually follows the GDPR uh, principles. There's something happening in US. There's a California consumer protection policies and everything. Uh, so a lot of people still claim that they their data collection uh, follow all the compliances which are GDPR compliant or whatever, but still there are no checks to that. That are there actually GDPR compliant or they are just a pointer on their uh, on their brochure or a presentation? Uh, because what happens at the at the back end it's a black box. Mm -hmm. Honestly, no one knows what's what's happening behind that. I mean, even even a generative AI or whatever the AI is happening right now, it's essentially black box. I mean, you don't know how that entire data has been collected. Uh, mm -hmm. What you can only see is the front end that you're just doing a prompt and something has been thrown to you. Uh, mm -hmm. What if there's some medical history of, of maybe uh, uh, Mr. Chobi can help that. What if someone's medical history has been feed in uh, to that chat GPT to throw those, uh, 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 those, those responses, which I mean, there could always be a uh, say that maybe it will help in the evolution of medical science. Uh, but at the same time, it's a medical history, the very personal information. Uh, so, yes, I, I see, I would raise, uh, love to raise a concern. Yes, it's a, it's a uh, flag, red flag for me. Uh, what we are doing personally right now, again, so that's again, sometimes our responsibility as a marketer also comes into the picture because if there is something available in the market and if I'm not leveraging that, mm -hmm. I would be come across as a not smart marketer because say, if you have all the data and sharp shooting data available, why are you mm -hmm. not doing that? So right. yes, sometimes I would say we do commit to those, uh, I would say well, crime would be a slightly bigger word, but we do fall into trap. Yes, I also want to come across uh, a latest marketer using all the smart technology to reach out my consumer in the most efficient way possible and save some money for my company. Uh, but yes, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky path and it should be addressed. I don't know what's the, uh, honestly, what's the right way to do that, but there has to be some guidelines. Okay. Mr. Chaubet. You know, this is, uh, well, okay, let me put it officially first. This is my personal uh, thought, not representing Metropolis. <laughs> okay. 
Like okay, sir, I'm a consumer first. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, definitely privacy is something which is being exposed uh, and it is being misutilized in every context. Now, uh, one simple example, the D&D. I mean, uh, we work in uh, offshore markets also. We have a uh, third world where we actually work uh, with in African subcontinents. I am so happy to see that the D&D rules have been so compliant that they can sue you in court for anything. Huh? I mean, but in India, we are so developed. Uh, but the DND, a simple DND itself is not being implemented so very properly. But all said and done, you know, uh, we, we, we somehow uh, try to put that star small mark conditions, you know, condition applies. And uh, for example, a simple promotion, scan this QR code and get a free health checkup. And there is a checkbox enabled. I am hereby willing to accept all communication from Metropolis. Okay, so that that's I, I'm willingly doing. I'm I'm going sinlessly doing that and ensuring that you know that is default checked, and submission button happens. So uh, someone comes in to the QR scanning, fill in his detail or her details, and that check button is also on, and then submit button. I have legally compliant. I mean, I'm I've got no reasons to. Uh, nobody can take me to the code at least in offshore market. India, I don't have to do that much also. And again, it's it's an individual thought. I'm not here by code. <laughs> talking about the practices we do, uh, we do far better things. So uh, all said and done, um, definitely privacy is something which needs to be taken care of. And in absence of any uh, decent broad guidelines, uh, mm -hmm. fortunately, government have just got a third party. Unlike try, we have another. Uh, now we have DND um, houses which can actually, you know, they initially they have S we have SMS protocols and uh, systems in place now that you know it the, the filtrations actually happen at that government agency. So you really have to pay some uh, amount of fees to ensure the filtration criteria of sending an SMS to someone in the in, in Indian telecom market today. So that has been a bit regularized, but still, you know, uh, on on uh, on websites or on campaigns for legion uh, these are things which have been really practiced and at least uh, you know we definitely say ashwatthama mara gaya but hathi tha so that way we you know get that checked and ensure that the privacy is been taken care of and i have a willingness from the consumer but all set and good i as a customer also feel sometimes cheated when it is coming to uh, me as in you know uh, my my data has been uh, i was giving you example of um, uh, alexa i mean think about the privacy of that nature i mean and i'm uh, we had practical experience I'm, i think on the forum there will be there are more digitally inclined people on the forum and i don't know whether they'll agree with me or not but i have gotten a promotional campaign Campaign immediately after discussing so far at my home, and Alexa was there. <laughs> so, what kind of privacy we are talking about? So, that's my thought on that. One more customer first privacy rules. So, yeah, we started the discussion with you, and I'm glad we're ending it with you. So, hey, shoot. <laughs> Okay, so again, I think let me just stay in line with the trends. Whatever I say is my own personal view. <laughs> See, I'll, I'll tell you, let's just go back a few decades ago, right? And think of the evolution of internet, okay? Internet was somewhere an agreement between corporations and individuals saying, I give you free information, data, etc. You give me your information and your data, right? The rule has not evolved in 20 years. So it's no longer gone to a stage where state is giving you access to free healthcare, free roads, free water, or free electricity or whatever, right? It is still managed by corporates. Uh, what do you expect? I mean, if you want free internet, you have to pay. There are no free lunches. You have to give something in return, right? Uh, that something in return is unfortunately your data, right? Your information. Uh, there are two sides to this coin. All this data and information that you are sharing is making your life better. You have personalized access to information. There is, I go to a website when I go the second time, I can start off from where I left, right? I don't have to refill my address every time I'm ordering something. Um, you know, my credit card details are saved on my frequently shopped apps, et cetera, et cetera. 
like anything, it will also come with its own downsides and perils. I think as long as the benefits are outweighing the negatives, um, mm -hmm. it's just unfortunately, but it's a state that we as consumers will need to learn to live with, right? Um, if I want none of it, I can just get off the internet tomorrow and like not care about it. I don't think that's possible in this world. Uh, and it, it's like TV, right? I mean, you have TV for entertainment, but too much TV has its own negatives, right? So I think it's the same logic here. I mean, it, it comes with a lot of benefits. It's, it's made our life so much easier. It also comes with its own negatives. Sounds great. So let's treat our consumers the way we want to be treated ourselves. I guess that's the <laughs> bottom line. And I am so glad we had this discussion. There were so many facets to this. And uh, I, I think we'll need more than one genie to make digital interaction with consumers seamless. But we have a few voices up our sleeve now after this discussion. Thank you so much for joining us and making this so much, so much fun. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks. much. It was a pleasure interacting with all of you. Great. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.